Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Animal Behavior Video Tracking Using AnyMaze Software. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our webinar today is sponsored by Stolting and is the second webinar in a two-part series all about the highly anticipated new release of AnyMaze video tracking software. Today we are joined by Chris Lloyd, inventor and lead developer of AnyMaze. Chris has been behind the development of behavioral testing software since the early 90s, designing custom behavior testing programs for private pharmaceutical companies and early stage video tracking systems for the University of Nottingham. It was in 1999 that he began working on what would become the first version of AnyMaze, which was officially launched in late 2003. In 2005, AnyMaze's behavior tracking software became part of the Stolting family and over the past 10 years has grown to be one of the world's foremost video tracking systems. Today, Chris leads the AnyMaze development team located in the UK. Okay, thank you Andy and uh, thanks everybody for joining us for this uh, second webinar on uh, video tracking using the AnyMaze software. Now, uh, we just saw that uh, most of you uh, did join us for the uh, the first session on uh, the 3rd of November um, and in that session as you'll recall I uh, went through a general introduction to the AnyMaze system uh, and then I also explored some of the advanced features of the system relating to video tracking. Uh, in today's session what I'm planning to do is to explain how AnyMaze actually goes beyond video tracking uh, and then after doing that, I'm going to uh, go into some details about uh, the features in AnyMaze that allow you to analyze your results and also to manage your experimental data. But I thought before I started that, it would be useful if I just did a quick recap on some of the things that uh, we looked at in session one. Now uh, that uh, will be helpful for those of you who watched session one because it was uh, more than a month ago so there may be some things which uh, have slipped your mind since and uh, for the 20% of you who didn't see session one uh, it'll hopefully mean that you don't get lost while I'm uh, going through this, uh, this session today. So uh, session one started off with a, a general overview of any maze uh, and then as I say we went through some of the uh, advanced features that are applicable to uh, certain specific pieces of apparatus. So what I'm going to do now is just jump back into AnyMaze and uh, it's only take a few minutes. I shall just briefly go back over some of the things that we talked about there. So I'm going to start AnyMaze up now. You should see that on your screens in a moment. So uh, the first thing that I mentioned about AnyMaze uh, during the previous session was the sort of general structure of the software. And uh, essentially it's uh, built around these five principal pages that we can see at the top left of your monitor where it says protocol, experiment, tests, results, and data. Uh, and in most experiments, you're going to start with the first one of these, and you basically work your way through from the left to the right. That's uh, so what we did in the previous uh, webinar, where we started off by creating uh, an experiment from scratch to uh, actually track an animal in an open field. And I still have that experiment that we set up during the previous session. And so if we just open that back up again, then... Uh, we can go back and have a look at some of the things that we did in that previous session. So I'm just switching to the protocol page here. And the protocol is essentially what uh, tells AnyMaze what apparatus you're working with and uh, what you want to do in that particular piece of apparatus. And it consists of these different elements that we can see listed down on the left hand side here. Uh, there's quite a long list of elements down there, uh, but you only actually have to set up quite a, a small number of them. Uh, and in the previous webinar, uh, we set up a video source, which was the camera where we were getting our video picture from. In fact, we were using a video file, not a camera, but it could be a camera or a video file. Uh, and then we set up our apparatus, which essentially tells AnyMaze what in the video picture that it's looking at is actually your apparatus, and also divides the apparatus up into different areas. And we then set up a couple of zones. So this was an open field that we were setting up, and if we have a quick look at what we did here, uh, we set up a center zone just by selecting different areas in the apparatus. Uh, so we just click on an area to include it or click it again to exclude it. Um, and we also set up some corner zones. These areas were things that we'd set up in the apparatus when we, we set up the apparatus in this previous element. Uh, we'd drawn these uh, different areas in. So that's most of what we actually had to do in order to start tracking in our open field in the last session. But there are a couple of other things that we looked at. Um, we set up the animal color, 
which is in fact the only thing you need to tell any maze in order for it to start tracking your animals. Uh, it's a very simple question, are the animals lighter or darker than the background of the apparatus? So clearly here we have a white mouse and a grey maze, he's lighter than the apparatus background. And then after that we set up the last of the, uh, the elements that we needed, which was stages. And uh, stages in any maze essentially divide your experiment up into uh, different parts. A good example of this is a water maze where you typically have something like a training stage where you actually train the animals to find a platform in the water maze. Uh, and then you'd have typically a probe stage where you're actually going to test the animals having treated them. Now in this very simple experiment we set up last time, we just had a single stage uh, which we call first stage. And uh, in that stage, we just had a single trial, so we can see here that it says the number of trials in this stage is one. And this is where we specify how long those trials are going to last, and we said we'd have a 60 second trial. So that was setting up our protocol. Uh, we then moved on to the second of the principal pages, the experiment page, and there uh, we set up the groups of animals that we're going to test in this particular experiment. So there's an important point here relating to the, the relationship between the protocol and the experiment. The protocol is essentially saying, this is how I do, in this case, an open field experiment. I'm interested in the animal's behavior in the corners, the animal's behavior in the center, and obviously you could set up other things as well. But having said that, you can then use that protocol in multiple experiments where you're just going to be testing different animals, perhaps with different treatments, but in the same apparatus. So in this case, I've said I've got uh, six saline animals that I want to test in my open field and six drug animals. Now, having set that up, we can move on to the test page, and this is where we'd actually perform our tests. And so uh, last time I introduced you to the uh, test schedule report, which is shown on the left-hand side here. And uh, here we can uh, see the list of all the different tests that we're going to perform in this experiment. And on the right-hand side, we can actually see the, uh, the video picture where we will be performing the tests. Now we did this last time, we ran some tests last time, and uh, we're going to be running some tests today as well, so I won't go back into that now. Uh, what I will just do is to uh, show you this is the test that we, we ran last time during the webinar, and uh, I pointed out last time that if we, if we point at one of the uh, numbers of the test numbers here, what we access is the test details report, and it's a test details report which can then show us the results for a specific test. So here we can see the results that we're interested in uh, for our open field. Uh, we looked at the distance the animal traveled, how many entries he made into those different zones, and so on. So that was the first part of the previous webinar where I was basically just trying to get the, the basic structure of any maze and how it works, uh, get you acquainted with the basic structure and, uh, and how it works. So having done that, we then talked about some of the specific features uh, relating to various different pieces of apparatus. Uh, and I certainly won't be going back through those now, but uh, just to sort of mention what they were, we looked at three-point tracking. So that was uh, tracking the animal's head, center point, and the base of his tail. And we also looked at heat maps, which show you the areas uh, in the apparatus where the animal spent the most amount of time. We looked at um, movable zones with reference to the uh, water maze where we were looking at the platform uh, which could be moved around into different locations within the maze uh, for different trials. And we also looked at something called procedures which allowed us to specify that when the animal found the platform we'd like any maze to automatically end the test. Uh, and finally we looked at uh, something for the Y maze where we were trying to determine the number of spontaneous alternations in the Y maze. And for that, we used a feature in any maze called sequences, which determines movements between different areas of the apparatus. And uh, we also used calculations to actually calculate the final value for our spontaneous alternations. So those are the different things that we, uh, we looked at in uh, the previous webinar, webinar number one. And uh, you may have noticed that uh, all of those things that I was talking about are all related to um, video tracking. That's hardly a surprise as any maze is a video tracking system. But uh, what I'd like to do uh, in the first part of today's webinar is actually uh, describe how any maze can go beyond uh, video tracking uh, and can actually be used uh, in other ways as well. And uh, the first part of that I'm going to be discussing uh, inputs and outputs. Now the first thing I should say is uh, the inputs and outputs, the, uh, this terminology actually comes from uh, the world of computing. Uh, where an input would be something like uh, your keyboard or your mouse, and an output would be something like the screen or the printer. 
Now we've borrowed that terminology in any maze, uh, and we're using it to refer to inputs, which would be things like a lever that the animal could press, or perhaps a photo beam that it could break. Uh, and outputs would be things like a lamp that we might turn on, or a shocker that we might use to give an aversive stimulus to the animal. So that's what we mean by inputs and outputs in any maze. Uh, one of the things with outputs is that uh, you'll typically want to control them uh, based on what's happening during a particular test. So you might say that you'd like to switch an output on, perhaps turn a light on, uh, when something happens in the test. And uh, that's something which comes back to the uh, procedures which we talked about briefly in the first session. Um, so you might say when an animal enters a certain zone you want to turn on a, a light or something like that. That's something that you do using procedures. So in this first part here, we're going to look at inputs, outputs, and we're going to revisit procedures. Okay, so I'm just going to jump back into any maze now. And I'm going to just open up a new experiment. This has absolutely nothing in it. Okay. Now, one of the points that I made in the previous webinar was that uh, we've kind of redesigned the uh, this list of protocol list in version 5.1 of AnyMaze, uh, and it's now grouped into uh, different sections. So we've got this general section, we've got tracking, uh, and then the third section we have here is called keys and I/O. Now, I/O is uh, an abbreviation for inputs and outputs, and so this is the part that we're going to be looking at now. But so you may spot that it says keys and I/O, but actually it only has one thing in it; it just says keys. So the first thing I'm going to explain is uh, how we get our I.O. items listed into this section. And the reason they're not there at the moment is because uh, this experiment is, uh, when we just start up a new experiment, it's in what we call the default protocol mode. And we can change the protocol mode using this list box here, which I'm just highlighting with the mouse. And if we have a look and see what it says here, it says, select the mode this protocol will use. This determines the features the protocol will include. And if we have a look at what the list shows us, there's quite a lot of protocol modes, but uh, the default one is the first, and then we have video tracking mode with inputs and outputs. Now, uh, I'll be coming back and talking a little bit more about these modes later, so for now, we'll just select this first one. And what we see is that we've now got that keys and I.O. section populated with a whole host of uh, different things relating to inputs and outputs. So that's the first thing to understand about inputs and outputs in any way, is you need to turn them on by selecting the right protocol mode. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to actually go through and give a little demonstration of using inputs and outputs, and I'll do that with uh, an experiment which I've already created. Uh, so I'm going to load that up now. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what we're going to do uh, in this demonstration is um, set up an experiment where we basically want to um, have an animal walking around in this apparatus that we can see, and uh, we've got a, a pellet dispenser. We haven't actually got a pellet dispenser. I want you to imagine that we have a pellet dispenser in this corner here, and uh, we have a lever here, and I'd also ask you to imagine that we have a shock floor underneath uh, this apparatus. So what we're going to try and do here is to say that as the animal moves about, if he goes over here to where the pellet dispenser is, then if he's previously pressed the lever, we're going to give him a pellet. But if he hasn't previously pressed the lever, then we're going to administer a shock. So it's quite straightforward. Animal goes into this zone. If he's pressed the lever, he gets a pellet. If he hasn't pressed the lever, he gets a shock. So how would we set that up within any maze? Well, obviously, we're going to do that in the protocol, so uh, we'll just switch into the protocol here and see how I've actually set things up to do this. Now, I'm not going to go through how we set up video sources or the apparatus uh, or the zones, because those are all things that I covered in the previous uh, session, uh, but we will just have a very quick look and see what the zone definitions are. So I set up two zones here. One is the lever zone, which is this uh, area here, where we're, we're imagining that there's a lever the animal can press. And then the uh, second zone is the pellet dispenser zone, which is the, uh, the corner up here where we're saying if the animal enters this area and he's not pressed the lever, then uh, he gets a shock, otherwise he gets a pellet. So those are the zones that we've set up, but now we clearly need to set up something in any maze to tell it that there's uh, a lever, there's a pellet dispenser, uh, and there's also uh, a shocker. And uh, we're going to do that using those IO items that we looked at earlier. So 
the first thing I did was to set up the lever and uh, I did that by saying add an item and then I went down to new input item and selected a new on off input now a lever is essentially just a switch it's something that's either on or off the animal's pressing the lever it goes on or off and that's why we're setting it up as an on off input and when I did that when I added it in I got a new element into here which is this lever here and I just called it the lever and basically that's all I need to do that's telling any maze that I now have an item within the protocol which is called the lever and is going to be just switching on and off during the test so the th second thing I needed to set up was the pellet dispenser now uh, pellet dispensers typically have a couple of wires coming out of them that if you connect them together will uh, dispense a pellet and they need to be connected together for a very short period of time typically about uh, a fifth of a second or a tenth of a second and the pellet dispenser will dispense a pellet so what we need is some way that any maze can essentially switch those uh, th those two wires together connect those two wires together and uh, to do that it needs something like a sort of a light switch that it can turn on and off and that's what uh, output switches are so here again I added a new item and I selected the output switch and uh, when I did that I got uh, this screen here where I said my output switch was called a pellet dispenser and I then specified that when activated this switch should pulse on for a short duration as I said what we want to do is to connect the two wires together just for a short period of time in order to get a pellet dispensed now typically you put in something like uh, 0.2 seconds something like that and I've actually entered two seconds I've exaggerated that so that we can actually see the pellet dispenser turning on during this little demo and we'll, we'll see that in a minute and then the final item I need is a shocker so again I added that into my protocol and when I did that uh, I got this item here which I then went and named shock floor and uh, I then specified that the duration of the shock should be two seconds and that the intensity of the shock should be three milliamps now again I've exaggerated this duration you wouldn't usually shock an animal for two seconds it might be uh, more like a quarter of a second or a half a second but I've exaggerated it so we can actually see when the shock floor is switched on so those are all the different parts that we need we've assembled all the different components but uh, what we still haven't done is to uh, explain to any maze what the logic is so if you remember what I said was if the animal presses the lever and then goes into the pellet dispenser zone he gets a pellet but if he goes in there without pressing the lever first he's going to get a shock so how do we explain to any maze how to apply that logic and the answer to that is uh, we use procedures now here what I've done is to set up two procedures uh, I could actually have just done this with one but using two slightly simpler uh, and it also shows something about procedures which I'd like to demonstrate to you which is that uh, you can have multiple procedures and they'll all be basically running all functioning in during a test at the same time simultaneously so we're going to see how that uh, fits together now so the first procedure I set up I called lever press and uh, you can see the procedure definition over on the right hand side of the screen now the way that procedures work in any maze essentially you take these different statements we can see in the center here and you just drag them over to the right hand side and build up your procedure uh, in this way it's a bit like building up with the Lego really you're just plugging the different parts together and the way a procedure is actually used in any maze is that during a test any maze will start off by performing the very first statement and then it just keep going it'll work its way down through the statements that you have performing each one in sequence um, and in this case the very first statement is a repeat and what that does is to say repeat the statements that are inside this sort of orange bracket that we have here and when it gets to the bottom of the orange bracket it tells it to get repeat forever so it goes back to the beginning again and it'll just do it all again so in this case it's just going to keep going round and round doing these two statements that we have inside and these two statements inside basically say wait until the lever is activated and when it is activated then it'll do the second statement which says set the lever press count to lever press count plus one so that's essentially going to make this lever press count one bigger uh, then it's going round to the beginning and waits until the lever is activated again and then it's going to increment it once more so essentially all this is going to do is count up how many times the animal presses the lever now in order to do that I needed this thing this lever press count and that's what we call a variable and I added that into my procedure uh, by using this create variable option up here uh, and what that does is uh, create a variable which is something that you can sort of conceptualize as uh, something like a little box that any maze has created inside itself and that box has lever press count written on top of it 
and at any time that you want to, you can open the box up and have a look and see what's inside. And in this case, what's inside is a number. And so what this is telling AnyMaze to do is, whenever the lever gets pressed, open up the box, make the number inside one bigger, and then shut the box again. And so inside that box, we're going to have how many times the lever's been pressed. And so that's what that procedure's doing. So we then have our second procedure, the pellet dispenser zone entry is what I've called it. And this is a little bit more complicated, but in fact quite similar. Again, we have a big repeat statement here, so it's going to say basically keep performing the same statements again and again, this group of statements inside. And again, it's waiting until something happens. In this case, it's waiting until the animal goes into the pellet dispenser zone. Now, when it does, we then use this uh, question, this if statement, to say if the lever press count is zero, so the animal's not pressed the lever, then we should activate the shock floor. Otherwise, we should activate the pellet dispenser. So essentially here, AnyMaze is looking inside that little box, seeing what the number is at the moment, and if it's zero, it shocks the animal. If it's not, it's going to dispense a pellet. Having done that, the last thing it does is to actually set that value back to zero again. So it basically negates the lever presses that have happened up till now, and it then goes back to the beginning and starts waiting until the animal has, uh, press, has entered the uh, pellet dispenser zone again and just keep repeating this same sequence. So these two procedures together, working in tandem, are actually going to implement that logic that I was talking about. And hopefully it's uh, fairly clear exactly sort of what they're doing and how they're doing it. So let's go and see this in action. If we go to uh, our tests page, I can just rewind this video when I start the test, and then let's begin the test and see what happens. Now, as I said, we don't actually have a pellet dispenser or a lever or anything in this apparatus, but I do have a lever connected to my computer, and uh, I'm going to be pressing that for the mouse, so I'm going to be working like the mouse. Now here, he went into the pellet dispenser zone. He hadn't pressed the lever, or I hadn't pressed it for him, so you might have spotted he uh, then got a shock. It said shock floor 3 milliamps on the screen. Now he comes down here and goes into our lever zone, and I'm going to press the lever for him. There we are. You can see on your screen it says lever. And uh, now when he goes in there, it says pellet dispenser. So now he's just been given a pellet because he had pressed the, uh, the lever. And I think he then goes back round and uh, he'll go back into the, uh, the lever zone again now. And I'm not going to press the lever for him this time. And so as a result of that, when he goes in there, he's going to get a shock. So there we are. That was the, uh, the logic that we specified that we wanted to use. And you could see how I created those different IO elements. and uh, how the uh, procedures that we use actually sort of glue that together and allow us to apply some logic to that. And of course, this is all working at the same time as we're tracking the animal around the cage. Now that test has now ended. So as you may recall, I can go over here to the uh, test schedule report and look at the results that I got from that. And there's a, a small point that I'll just highlight here, which is that inputs and outputs in any maze can generate results. So in this case, I've asked it the system to list up the number of activations of the pellet dispenser. And as you'll probably recall, I only pressed the lever once. So on one occasion that the animal went into the pellet dispenser zone, uh, he got a pellet. Uh, on two other occasions, he got a shock. Okay, so let's just go back into the protocol again and uh, have another quick look at that list of inputs and outputs that we have. It's a pretty substantial list, uh, and we just use some of them, but I'm just going to briefly go through and uh, introduce what all these other items in here are actually for. So uh, on-off inputs we've met already. That's what we're using for our lever. That's a switch. And they can actually be used for other things as well. Anything that basically can be either on or off. So a photo beam, for example, which might be connected uh, across a nose poke hole so that you can detect on-off inputs from the animal's nose poke. Or perhaps across uh, a door in a piece of the apparatus where you can walk through and you could determine he's walked through that door. Uh, they can also be, on-off inputs can also uh, be fed into any maze from some other apparatus. So, for example, you might have an electrophysiology system that you'd like to synchronize with any maze, and you could use an on-off input to do that. The electrophysiology system would generate a signal, a digital signal, uh, that would come into any maze as an on-off input, and any maze would detect that, and you could use that as a way of synchronizing the two systems. 
The second item we have are signal inputs. The signal inputs are typically going to be a voltage, and that's going to be a voltage coming from some other piece of apparatus. Uh, for example, you could use a signal input with uh, a telemetry system, which is perhaps detecting um, the animal's heart rate or the animal's core temperature. And that would come into any maze as a signal input, as a voltage coming out of the other equipment. Uh, and you'd be able to then see the heart rate or the, uh, the temperature as the animal's moving around in the apparatus. You then have sensors. Any maze uh, supports four different types of sensors, temperature, uh, humidity, weight, uh, and light. So you can detect all of those different things in any maze um, and use those uh, within your, uh, your procedures as well. We have rotary encoders. As the name implies, a rotary encoder is basically detecting when something rotates, and that's most typically used with uh, a running wheel. So it's used to detect the, the uh, rotations of the running wheel, count how many rotations you're getting. So then getting to some output items, we've already met the output switches. Those are the things that I said are a bit like a light switch that any maze can control. Uh, and you can use those for all sorts of things. So you could actually use them to turn a lamp on and off, for example. Uh, we use them here to uh, control a pellet dispenser. You could also use them perhaps to control a motor that might control a door that gives access to different parts of the apparatus. We then have speakers. Any maze can play uh, any tone, uh, any sound file that's on your computer, or, or um, any white noise as well. And uh, it can do that at uh, any volume, so it can control the volume as well. We have analog outputs, which are basically a voltage coming out of your computer. So this will be a voltage which is being controlled by what the animal's doing. So for example, you might say that you'd like to have a voltage which gets bigger as the animal moves across the maze. So uh, as he moves towards the right-hand side of the maze, perhaps the, uh, the voltage would go up, and as he moves to the left-hand side, the voltage would go down. You have a couple of controllers, a temperature controller and a lighting controller. Uh, a temperature controller, as the name implies, allows you to make something hotter or colder during the experiment, and a lighting controller allows you to make lights uh, lighter or dimmer. And then finally, we have syringe pumps, uh, which basically allow you to control things like flow rate, uh, duration of the syringe pump is on, uh, the direction the infusion will withdraw. Uh, and finally, uh, we've got shockers at the very bottom, which we've already seen. Now, all of these things can be controlled uh, by the procedures. So, for example, you could say that because something's happened in your maze, you'd like to alter the uh, flow rate of your syringe pump, or you'd like to get the temperature controller to make something hotter. Uh, so, there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do uh, by taking these inputs and outputs and amalgamating with these procedures. A very final point I make about inputs and outputs is uh, perhaps a question that you're asking yourselves, which is, okay, he's telling me that we've got all these possibilities, but how does that actually work? How do I connect a lever to my computer? Clearly, there's no input on my computer that says, connect a lever here. And the answer to that is that you need uh, some type of an interface device. And uh, Anime supports a range of interface devices. Uh, we manufacture our own interface devices, which are called the AMI devices, and there's a family of them. Um, and they support pretty much all the different things that you can see down on this list. So you can use an AMI device, uh, for example, to connect um, a lever, or you can use an AMI device to connect uh, a rotary encoder that's connected to a running wheel. Uh, an AMI device can play sound through speakers and so on. But we also support other devices from third parties as well. Now, there's a couple of things more about those devices that I'll mention. We have a specific device which has been designed uh, for controlling optogenetic lasers. Uh, and that device can actually goes into any maze as an output switch. Um, but one of the things that you can do there is to say what frequency you'd like that to switch at. So you could say turn on and then pulse my laser at perhaps 20 hertz or something like that. Um, and the other thing is that uh, syringe pumps don't actually need an interface at all because most syringe pumps actually have what's called a serial connector on the back. And uh, that can plug into a USB port. And that means that any maze can control a syringe pump directly without needing any other interface. Uh, to do that, any maze needs to actually understand what the syringe pump is. That means we need to actually include it within the software. And we currently have support for the syringe pumps from uh, Harvard Apparatus, uh, KDS, New Era, and uh, also our own QSI syringe pump. Okay, so the uh, 
The second part of uh, this uh, taking any maze beyond video tracking that I'm going to describe is uh, ways in which you can use any maze to uh, help you score behaviors manually. Now, uh, clearly any maze is a video tracking system. It can see the animal moving around in your apparatus. But there are some things which, uh, frankly, the computer is not going to be able to tell you. For example, you might want to know when the animal's grooming. And uh, any maze is not going to be able to automatically determine when the animal's grooming. But uh, you can. You could be looking at the screen and saying, I can see that the animal's grooming, and I'd like to score that myself uh, and tell AnyMaze that the animal's grooming at this moment. And so what I'm going to do now is show you how you do that within AnyMaze. So uh, let's just do exactly what I'm describing here, this grooming example. Uh, and let's just add grooming to this experiment that we're looking at, uh, we've been looking at for our inputs and outputs. So how would we do that? Well, the answer is we'd use this element here, these keys. So what we do is we'd add a new item to our protocol and say a new key. And uh, let's call it the grooming key. And then we just specify which key on our keyboard we're going to press. And uh, I'm going to use G because it'd be nice and easy to remember. Uh, and that's it. I've uh, done what I need to do in order to ensure that uh, any maze has got somewhere to store that information about grooming. Now, uh, if I just get down here, I'm just going to want to check that while I'm testing, it's going to show me that, because I'd like you to see it on the screen. So yes, it's going to list any active keys while the test is running. So if we go back and actually run that test again, uh, then if we just wait a moment, my colleague will come in. And I'm just going to press the, uh, the G key on the keyboard whenever I consider that the animal's grooming. Now, I'm not sure he does any grooming, so I'm going to lie. I'm going to say he's grooming now, he's stopped, and... Uh, Let's just wait a moment and let's say that, uh, for example, he's grooming again now and uh, perhaps again now. So you can see there that as I press the key, AnyMay shows you on the screen that uh, you're pressing the key and uh, it's scoring that the animal's grooming at that moment. Now I'm going to end this test so we don't have to sit through it for 60 seconds. Um, I'm going to store the results. And if we go to our test schedule report, then we can go and look at the results that we have for that. Now, as you'll recall from the previous webinar, whenever we look at these results, we find that they don't show us the things that we've just done because I didn't enter that into the protocol. But uh, I need to actually say in the protocol what results I'd like to see listed here. So this shortcut will take me to that. And here I can say that for the whole apparatus, I'd like to see, and if we scroll down a bit here, I'd like to see the results for grooming. So I've got the number of presses and the time the key was pressed. I've got a fair number of different results for grooming, but those are the ones I'm going to choose. An important point here is that AnyMaze doesn't just give you the results for the entire apparatus, but it'll also split them off between the different zones. So if we look at this pellet dispenser zone, if we look at the bottom here, we've got a section for grooming there as well. And I can see the same information. How many times has the key pressed in this particular zone and for how long? So if we go back to our tests page now, we can see we've got those results. So I press the key three times for a total of 4.5 seconds. We can see that information here. And uh, then in the pellet dispenser zone, I press the key once for a total of two seconds. So this is quite a nice feature of AnyMaze because what you can be doing is actually watching the animal uh, moving around the maze and see what behavior he's performing. Uh, and you don't have to think about whereabouts in the maze he is as he's doing this behavior. You don't have to worry about where he is when he's grooming. AnyMaze will do that automatically for you and just give you the results split up between the different areas that you've defined within your maze. Now that's a fairly straightforward process, uh, but I'd just like to uh, take it one level further and imagine that uh, not just gr we're not interested in just grooming, but we're also interested in uh, some other behaviors as well, which we'd like the system to score, we'd like to score manually. So let's take an example there perhaps of uh, the animal rearing, which AnyMaze could detect if we put some photo beams in here, but if we don't have those, then it's not going to give you automatically give you data about uh, the rearing of the animal. And let's say we also want to score some sniffing behavior. So we've got a couple of extra behaviors that we want to score. Now, to set those up would be quite straightforward. We go back to the protocol and just add some more keys. But the problem you'd have is that you then need to be watching the animal, deciding which of those three behaviors he's performing, and press the keys on the keyboard. Now, you might be able to do that with three behaviors, but let's say you actually had eight behaviors that you were interested in. Now, if you got to that point, then clearly it's going to be almost impossible for you to be pressing eight different keys depending on what the animal's doing. And so what I'm going to show you now is how AnyMaze tackles that particular problem. 
So I've got another example that I set up for this. Uh, so if we just go and open that. So here we're still in our same open field, but if we can have a look at what I've done in the protocol, here basically I've just set up three keys for rearing, grooming, and sniffing, and the keys are R, G, and S, as you might expect. Now before we go and see how we'd actually go about uh, scoring the behavior for these three keys, I'd just like to uh, go back to something we mentioned earlier, which was the, uh, the protocol mode. And uh, as you recall, earlier on, uh, we switched from the video tracking mode to video tracking with I.O., but in this experiment, we're actually using a complete different mode. We're using a mode called Take Note Video Observation Mode. Now, if we have another look at that list of modes, we'll see that there's actually three different Take Note modes down here. And the way that they differ to the, uh, the modes above, the video tracking modes, is that they're not going to track the animal at all. So in this case, what we're doing with AnyMaze is saying that uh, we want to run an experiment where we're not going to be tracking the animal, we're just going to be observing it. And we're going to be observing it on a video. And that may be a live video from a camera, or it may be that we actually recorded the animal at some point, and now we want to score that particular video. So these take note modes are really designed where you want to score something manually, but you're not doing video tracking. And we've got three of them, uh, take note video observation mode, We've got another one where you've got video observation with inputs and outputs, so that's incorporating the things that we saw just a minute ago. And then we've got one last one, which is take note direct observation mode, where you're actually going to be looking at the animal yourself directly, and you're not going through a video at all. Now, the, uh, the effects of these, these different modes is simply to reduce the options that you have in the uh, protocol. So what we can see here is all the things relating to zones, to points, sequences, and so on, have been removed, uh, and our protocol has become a great deal simpler. So that's really the main, the main effect of this. So if we now go back to our tests page, uh, we're going to run a test here. And uh, because we're not tracking in this, I'm actually going to have to... Uh, just start this test myself manually. Anyways, won't start it automatically as it's been doing in all the other tests that we've performed. So if we wait for my colleague to put the animal in, then uh, I'm just going to start this test now. And then I'm going to be watching the animal, and as before, when he's grooming, I'm going to press the G key, and uh, he stops, I release it. You may notice here that it's not showing grooming next to the animal because it's not tracking him. So it's just showing it up in the top right-hand corner. When I press the G key, it says grooming in the top right-hand corner there. Okay, it's a very short test. It's just 20 seconds. Uh, so if we go and look at our res results for that test, we can see that uh, we got three bouts of grooming. I pressed the key three times, but we got no bouts of rearing and no bouts of sniffing. Well, that's not surprising because I didn't press the keys. Now. What we're saying here is that uh, I'd like to record all of these different behaviors, but uh, I find it too difficult to determine what the animal's doing and press three different keys at the same time. Uh, so what I can do is do what I just did, run one test and score one behavior, but then I can go back and watch the video again and score a different behavior. And the way that I do that is to say to Eddie Mays that I want to mark this particular test that has now been performed for additional scoring. And what that does is... Uh, Anyways, queues that up straight away to say, okay, I'm ready to add additional scoring to this test. And at this point, if I say start, what it's going to do is go find the correct video, which happens to be the one we're playing. It'll rewind it, and then it'll automatically start the test at exactly the same time as it started it last time we played this video. So it starts the test at the same time, and now I could uh, watch this animal, and whenever he's rearing, I can press the R key on the keyboard uh, and score the rearing behavior as well. As I said, this is only a 20-second test, so it'll be over very shortly. And uh, if we now go and... That's the test has ended now. If we now go and look at the results again, we can see that we've now got three bouts of rearing as well, because uh, I pressed the rearing key three times, and that's over here. And uh, we've got uh, rearing for 2.7 seconds. Now, clearly, I still haven't scored sniffing, so I could go back and say I want to do additional scoring again for this test, and I could do exactly the same process uh, and press the S key on the keyboard to score the sniffing. 
So there's no limit to how many keys you can have, and there's no limit to uh, how many times you can go back through a test and add additional scoring in this way. So if you've got a, a, a complex test where you're looking at a lot of different behaviors, then this is a great feature because it allows you to go back over the test multiple times and, uh, and score different behaviors on each occasion. And this isn't something that's limited to that take note mode that we're using in this case. Uh, you could use this equally well in uh, any of the video tracking modes as well. Okay. So those are the two things that I really wanted to talk about relating to uh, taking any maze beyond video tracking. Uh, we looked at the inputs and the outputs, and we looked at ways that you can score behaviors manually. So that's the first part of today's webinar. The second part that I'm going to talk about is uh, analyzing results and managing your data. Now there are four different sections to this and uh, I'm just going to work through them one at a time and show you each one in any maze. So the first section we're going to talk about is statistical analysis, graphs and track plots. So let's just jump back into any maze again. So one of the things that you've perhaps spotted is that all the way through both the first webinar and so far today, I've always been looking at test results uh, in this test details report. So every time we've wanted to look at results, I've gone to the test schedule. And then uh, in the test schedule, I've chosen a particular test that I'm interested in. So perhaps test one in this case. And then on this test details report, uh, I've been looking at the test results. Now clearly the test schedule is showing us that any maze has all the tests for an entire experiment recorded in one place. Uh, and if you recall, when we set up the experiment, we were actually putting our animals into different treatment groups. We've got saline animals and drug animals. So really what you'd be interested in isn't so much those results for an individual test, but the results for your saline group and your drug group. Uh, and you'd probably want to be comparing those to see if you've got any difference between your groups. And that's what I'm going to be showing you now. And that's something that we do using the results page. And this particular experiment, we've only got a couple of tests that we've run, so it's going to be quite hard to look at any meaningful results. So what we'll do is just open up another example. And this has a lot of results in it. And this is a water maze example experiment where we uh, basically trained the animals to find the platform in the water maze. Um, we trained them over a course of six different trials. And at the end of that period, they're all finding the platform uh, within under 30 seconds. So uh, at that point, we considered that they were all trained. Uh, they knew where the platform was. So we then went on and uh, we treated them either with uh, saline or one of these doses of compound X that you can see listed up here. Uh, and we then, treated, we then tested them one more time in the, uh, the water maze to see whether they could still remember where the platform was. So if we have a quick look at the test page here, we can see our test schedule report. So here we have all of those training uh, tests that we performed. And then right at the bottom here, we have the, uh, the treated tests. So these are the pro this is the probe trial after we treated the animals. Uh, and as always, we can select one of these test numbers and we can go and see the individual results. So in this particular case, the animal found the platform in just 3.1 seconds. So it went pretty much directly to the platform. So the test duration here tells us how long he took to find the platform, because when he finds it, we end the test. So as I say, what we'd really like to know is, well, what sort of results do we have comparing our saline and compound X groups? And that's what we'll see on the results page. So what I'm going to do here is just jump straight in and show you one of the results reports, and then we'll come back and I'll describe what the different options we had here are. So if we view this report, what we're seeing here is the uh, test duration, so how long the animal took to find the platform in our probe trial uh, and analyzed between our different treatment groups. So we can see uh, the saline animals, which had six animals in the group, took uh, on average about 9.3 seconds to find the platform. And then as we increased compound X dosage, uh, so we seem to get rather a poor effect on their memory. They took longer and longer to find the platform. Uh, it'd be much easier to see that as a graph. And we have different report styles uh, and I'm going to select a graph style here, uh, and we can then see a, a graph of that same data. And here it uh, seems fairly evident that there seems to be some sort of dose-related dose uh, response uh, in our particular experiment here. Now, uh, we just saw that the 
group sizes that we have are pretty small. The N for saline was six, and I think all the compound X groups only have five animals in them. And we've got some pretty big error bars here as well. So although it looks as if we've got an effect, it may not actually be statistically significant. Now we can find that out by going to the third of our report styles, statistical. Uh, and in this case, what we're going to see is that uh, any maze has used uh, an ANOVA to uh, tell us that there is indeed some difference between these groups. And then I've chosen to use a, a Dunnett's t-test uh, for a comparison to control uh, as my post hoc test. And here we can see that we do indeed have a difference between the saline animals and the animals who got 10 milligrams per kilogram of our compound X. So there we can see that any maze incorporates within it the ability to actually collate the data for the different groups and analyze it for you. Now what I'll do briefly now is just go back to the first one of these report styles, the text report, uh, and just explain what those report settings were. So uh, the first set of settings that we have are results to include. This is essentially just saying what data we want to have on the report. So if we also selected, for example, average speed, uh, we go and look at that, then what we can see now is two different sets of data, the test duration here that we had before, and now we've also got data for the average speed. So that's all that we're doing there by selecting the uh, results to include. Moving on down, we can see that we can group the data, and here I was choosing to group the data by treatment, that's why we were seeing it split up between different treatment groups. Uh, but I could, for example, have said I want to see uh, the data split up between the sex of the animals. So here we can see the results for the male and the female animals. I'm just going to set that back to treatment. Okay. Uh, then we have report format. So here it's just saying what information we want included in the report. For example, I said I'd like to see the standard deviation. And then finally, we have a section for filtering the tests that are actually going to be analyzed. So in this case, I wasn't interested in my training trials. I'm only really interested in the trial after I treated the animals. And so here I selected just that one trial, and that's why the results that I'm seeing in the report are only including that single trial. Now we have settings for uh, text, different settings for graph, but very similar. Um, and you can see here we've got results to plot, so that's very similar to the results to include uh, data grouping, the graph type. So instead of saying what information we want on the report, we can specify what graph type we'd like. And again, we've got a section for filtering. Now for statistical analysis, things are slightly different. I particularly wanted to highlight this one to you. But here we change the terminology slightly. So the result to include becomes our dependent variable uh, and the grouping is our independent variable. Uh, then we have a section for options where we can actually choose what sort of stats tests we want to perform. And we first of all have a sort of top level question. Do we want to use parametric or non-parametric stats? Uh, but then we have a second question, which is what post hoc test do we want to use? But it seems as if we're sort of missing another question, which is, well, what um, main statistical test do you want to use? And so when we looked at our, our test duration, for example, we, we saw that I was using an ANOVA there. Uh, then maze doesn't always use an ANOVA for all your different, ANOVA for all your different uh, measures. It actually chooses the most appropriate uh, stats test for the data that it's going to be analyzing. So if we just turn off average speed, but we say we'd like to analyze the first zone entered, let's see what it would do in those circumstances. So we can still see up here test duration, it's analyzing using an ANOVA, but the first zone entered, it's switched to using a chi-squared test. And the reason it's done that is because this is categorical data. Uh, we're saying which zone did the animal go into first? So it can only possibly be one of a certain number of options. Uh, and the most appropriate stats test for that kind of data is the chi-squared test. So that's what it's chosen to use. So this is quite a nice feature of AnyMaze because it means you don't have to worry about thinking about what type of test you should use for the data that you're choosing here. AnyMaze is going to do that for you uh, and automatically apply the most appropriate test uh, for the data that you've got. Now, having said that, there's no such thing as the most appropriate post hoc test. Uh, so in that case, uh, you do get to choose which post hoc test you'd like AnyMaze to use. Uh, and we've included a, a fair few here. So hopefully the one you like to use is, uh, is somewhere in that list. So those are the uh, functions that we have for um, looking at uh, the, basically looking at the results collated and analyzed. Uh, but we have one final report style here that I haven't mentioned yet, which is the track plot report style. And uh, 
we have a quick look at that, we've got options for what sort of plot we want to see. So I've said I want to see a, a plot of the center point of the animal. And these, I'd like to have these grouped by treatment. And again, I'm just limiting it to the treated trial. If we have a quick look at what that shows us, we get this report where we can see the tracks for the animal um, in the sailing group. And so we can see in this case that they're basically swimming almost directly to the platform. A few of them didn't go too directly, but they seem to certainly know where the platform is. But if we scroll down to the animals who had 10 milligrams per kilogram of our uh, compound X, then uh, we see a very different story. And here we can see that they uh, clearly don't have much of a notion where the platform is. They're swimming all around the place. Now, these sorts of things are great for incorporating into PowerPoint presentations or posters or perhaps even including in a paper. And uh, it's worth mentioning at this juncture that uh, all these reports and graphs and things that we're seeing can be copied, uh, saved to files in different formats, printed, and so on. Another nice feature is the fact that if you point at a particular trap plot, so if we took this one here and you right-click, then you can actually say just copy that individual plot. Uh, and that'll copy it to the clipboard in what's called a vector format. And that means that you can put it into something like PowerPoint and resize it. Uh, and it'll still have very smooth edges. It won't go all blocky like a photograph would do. And that applies to, uh, to trap plots and also applies to graphs. You can actually just take out individual graphs just by copying them from the system. Okay. So that was the first of this, uh, this part, statistical analysis graphs and trap plots. The, uh, the second area I'm going to describe now is uh, transferring data to other programs. Now we've just seen that uh, AnyMaze can do some statistical analysis, it can generate some graphs and so on, but we're certainly not trying to say that AnyMaze is a replacement for SPSS uh, or for whatever graph system you like to use. Uh, what it does do is give you a quick way of getting uh, some statistical analysis performed or quickly looking at a graphical representation of your data. But we certainly accept that you're going to want to take the data out and move it elsewhere. And uh, so what I'm going to show you now is how you do that. So getting back into AnyMaze again. This is something that we do using the very final page of these five pages, and that's the data page. Now, as you can see, the uh, data page is essentially just a big spreadsheet. And uh, what we have here is one row for each test in the experiment. And uh, we then have columns showing us different results. So for example, we've got a column here for the distance traveled and a column here for the latency to find the, uh, the island. Now we can choose what columns we want to have included. So we just say select data. And uh, we can then say that we'd like to see different information as well. So perhaps we'd go down here and say we'd like to see some results for our northwest quadrant of our maze. How many times did the animal go in there? And uh, how much time did you spend in there? If we go back to our spreadsheet, we've now got that information included. So you can choose the information you'd like to see in the spreadsheet. And then you can just copy the spreadsheet, for example, uh, or you could save it to a file, or you could send it by email. So, for example, you might choose to send it to yourself by email so you'd have it on your, uh, your, work, your office computer. And you can choose parts of the spreadsheet. You could just say you want certain rows uh, or certain columns or just a block of the spreadsheet. So you can choose different parts of it, copy, and uh, move them around. And the information you take from here will paste directly into programs like SPSS or into Excel. And you don't have to do any more sort of massaging of the data in any way. It just go directly there. So that's how you get data out of AnyMaze. So the next thing I'm going to describe is uh, analysis of results over time. Now, this is actually something that uh, we, we got quite a few questions about uh, in our registration questionnaire. So uh, I shall now just go through and explain how it is in AnyMaze that you could analyze your results, uh, not just for the entire test, but uh, split up. Uh, across time. So what we can see here, for example, is we have a test, uh, test number one, which I'm highlighting here, where the animal actually swam in this water maze test uh, 30 meters during the test. But you might be saying to yourself, well, that's fine, but uh, I'd be interested to know whether he was swimming uh, most of that 30 meters perhaps in the first half of the test and then not very swimming very much in the second half of the test, or was he swimming pretty consistently throughout the duration of the test? And clearly, uh, that sort of question isn't something you can answer using any of the things that we've seen so far in AnyMates, because we're always getting results for an entire test. 
So you can get that answer, and uh, the way you do it is in the protocol. If we scroll down to the bottom section here, which is called Analysis and Results, we'll find a section called, an element called Analysis Across Time. And here we can specify the duration of what we call time segments. And these are sometimes called time bins, they're the same thing. And essentially what this is doing is chopping the, experiment, the, the test up into 30 second uh, chunks, and it's then going to give you the result for each of those 30 second chunks. Now I'm just going to open a different example where I've already got this set up. Uh, So in this example, we have uh, a barns maze, and uh, basically we've just tracked the animals around this barns maze for a couple of minutes. And what I've then said in the protocol is that uh, I'd like to see the results and analyzed across time and split up into 15 second time segments. So if we go and have a look at our results page and see what we get for that, then uh, here I've said I want to look at the total distance traveled and group the data by the segment of test uh, and then split it up also between the different treatment groups. So what we can see there is that uh, in the first 15 seconds, the saline animals, we have a result here for their average distance they travel is about one meter and the drug animals again one meter. The second 15 seconds, we can see again saline and drug results and so on. But uh, as previously, it's going to be much easier for us to sort of understand that data if we look at a graph. So if we switch to the graph format, we can now see that uh, the purple line here represents our drug group and the blue line our saline group. We can see that we seem to have some difference between our two different groups. The, the drug animals pretty much continued throughout the duration of the test, um, moving about roughly um, 0.9 meters in each 15 second time bin. But uh, the saline animals tailed off towards the end of the test. In fact, they sort of descended linearly uh, throughout the test and at the end they're only going about 0.2 meters uh, in each 15 second block. So that's a, a simple way to analyze your data across time using uh, time segments in any maze. And there is actually a second way to analyze data across time, and that's using something we call the time period. And what that does is to essentially just take a chunk of your test and give you the results for that particular chunk. So let's imagine that you had a 10-minute test and you were particularly interested in the animal's behavior between perhaps two minutes and five minutes. So that three-minute period, starting at two minutes and running up to five. It'd be quite hard to do that using these time segments because you couldn't design any particular time segment which would give you that exact three-minute period that you're interested in. And the solution to that is, again, in the protocol, under analysis across time, you could say you want to add an item, and the item you want to add is a new time period. And you just say that's called two to five minutes, and you just specify that it's going to start at uh, two minutes and end at five minutes. And having done that, any maze is then going to analyze your results and make this little block of two to five minutes, this three minute block, available to you. So all the results you'd normally see will now also be available just for this block. You'd still see all the results of the entire test if that's what you want, but you'd have this as well. And you could create another time period, so you can have multiple time periods for different parts of your test. So those are the two ways of analyzing data across time in any maze. You can use time segments, sometimes called time bins, uh, and you can use time periods. And that almost brings us to the, uh, the end of today's webinar, but the uh, last thing that I'll very quickly mention is, uh, again, a question that we got quite a few of you asking us, which is, how can I access the raw data for any maze? So this would be the raw information that any maze is actually recording while it's tracking the animals, essentially the X, Y coordinates of the animal in the maze. So let's just go back to uh, any maze and look at this. So the answer to this is that you can get this information by going to the test schedule report, uh, choosing one of your tests, so let's choose test number four here, for example, and that'll take us to the test details report, which we've seen before. And here we have some related reports. This is something we met in the previous webinar. And one of the related reports that we have is the test data report. And what that shows us is the animal's center position, his X and Y coordinates of his center position, for all the different time points that any maze recorded during the test. So this is basically all the raw data for the center position. As you'll recall, any maze also tracks the animal's head and his tail, uh, so that information is also available 
what information you see here in this spreadsheet is set up in the protocol. So we've got a little shortcut here that'll take me directly to the right place in the protocol. So if I select that, I could say I'd also like to see the position of the animal's head uh, and perhaps also information about uh, when he entered the holes zone that I have in this apparatus. So if we go back to the test page now, our spreadsheet's been updated to incorporate that. And uh, I could then copy that spreadsheet, save it to a file or whatever. So that's how you can get access to this, this raw data. Now there's one little snag with that, which is, uh, as you saw, to get to this, I went from the test schedule report where I have all my tests in my experiment listed, I selected a test I was interested in, and then I said related reports and test data report. But um, what if I had, as uh, we had in that water maze example earlier, 160 different tests that have all been performed, and I wanted to get this data out for all 160, it would be extremely tedious. I'd have to go through those little sequence that I've just been through there for every single one of them, and then save this report as a, a file in each case. So to overcome that, uh, AnyMaze incorporates what we call our data tools, and they're available on the file page. And here we have data tools. And here, the second of these data tools, export test data, basically allows you to export that test data spreadsheet for every test uh, all in one go. So basically what it's going to do is create uh, as many files as you have tests in your experiments. If you have 160 tests in your experiment, you'll get 160 files. They'll be called test one, test two, and so on. And they'll, each one will contain that spreadsheet we were just looking at. Now for the more uh, technically savvy of you, um, there's actually a second option, which is to output this as an XML file. Uh, and what that does is create a single file which contains uh, all the information about the experiment in just one place. Now you can choose what particular information you're interested in. But what's nice about the XML is it's a standardized format and it can be read by programs like MATLAB uh, and Excel and various other programs as well. Uh, and so this would be a good way, for example, to get that raw data into a system such as MATLAB. You could output, output it as XML. All right, so again, thank you, Chris, for the very informative session. Uh, one final thing, uh, because we've had this come up uh, after session one and uh, today as well, it's questions that have come in regarding the price of any May software and specifically how updates are managed. Uh, so could you clarify this for the audience? Yes, I certainly can. Um, so the uh, the price of any is $5,995. Uh, and that is a single price that gets you the entire system. We don't have any modules or add-on parts or anything. That's a single price for everything that you've seen throughout both of these webinars. Mm -hmm. um, and when you buy the system in that way, it's then yours forever. So uh, you're not having to pay anything additional to that uh, in order to own and use the software forever. Uh, and another point I just make on that is that you also get technical support forever. So you don't have to pay anything extra to get technical support either. And there is one other additional payment you can choose to make, and that's to uh, get updates to the software. So when you buy the software from us, we will give you all updates during one year after you've purchased it. So that's included in that uh, initial $5,995 price. After the end of the first year, if we produce another update after that, you won't get that update uh, automatically included in that price. You would actually have to then buy what we call an updates contract. Uh, that costs $495. And what that'll do is give you all updates from the moment you buy it for another 12 month period. You don't have to do that every year in order to stay current. If you, for example, decided that uh, in the second year of earning any maze, there was an update, but it didn't really interest you. There was not a feature that was relevant to what you're doing. You might just say, well, I'm not going to pay anything this year and uh, I'll just let that go by. Perhaps the year after that, we produce an update and you think, oh, that one is interesting. So then you'd pay your $495. You would get the most up-to-date version of any maze and all updates released during the 12 month period after that. So the point I'd like to stress here, and the thing, the thing that was causing a little confusion, is that the 5995 price uh, gets you a copy of AnyMaze, and it gets you co that copy of AnyMaze forever. You don't, have to, you don't have to pay anything more. If you want to stay current after 12 months, then you have the option of paying 495 and, and staying current in that way. So uh, hopefully that uh, dispels uh, some of the mystery about the, the pricing of any maze. It's just two things, two simple prices, one for the software uh, and a different price for the updates. Perfect. And, and updates when you feel you need them as they apply to your research. 
Exactly. You don't have to say, oh, I've got to always pay that every year. Uh, you just pay when it's, uh, it's relevant to you. Brilliant. Great. That, uh, that certainly clarifies things. Thanks, Chris.